you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Experience Weekly Data Talk, a show where we talk with data science leaders from around the world. Today, we're talking with Dr. Mike Tamir. He's the head of data science at Uber ATG. He's also a lecturer for UC Berkeley School of Data Science. We're super excited to have Mike with us. Today, we're talking about using deep learning to detect and reduce the spread of fake news. Um, Mike Tamir is associated uh, with fakerfact.org. Uh, for those listening to the podcast, that's spelled F-A-K-E-R-F-A-C-T-O-R-G. Uh, you can get the Chrome extension, uh, learn more by going to fakerfact.org. Uh, Dr. Mike Tamir, thank you so much for being our guest today. Oh, thanks, for, thanks so much for having me. So Mike, can you share with us a little bit about your, your journey to begin working in data science? We have a, an awesome data science community that tunes in every single week, and we always, learning, we always love learning from our guests about their journeys that led them to where they're, where they're working today. Sure, yeah, I, uh, I, I was really lucky, I think is probably the short answer. <laughs> I, I, um, I was finishing up some research. I got into uh, machine learning almost by accident uh, as part of, uh, as part of my, my, uh, my, my graduate studies. Um, and I got really into it at a time when uh, not, um, not a lot of people were working in machine learning or um, doing what, what now is called data science. And so um, I, I was able to, to sort of ride the, um, ride the excitement and be, uh, be involved with the creation of the data science profession for, um, for almost a decade now. Wow. So when you were, what did you study in school? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, it's, a, a if, if you ever want to be a, a, a philosophy major, um, yeah. then, then I guess you, you know, I, I'm, a example of, of how you can get a job when even if you study philosophy. Oh, I um, love that. <laughs> uh, so my undergrad was mathematics and philosophy. Uh, my, my, uh, graduate, uh, um, my graduate school, I, I actually went to a philosophy of physics program. Wow. Um, and so, so, I, so I, did, I did get to do, do, do technical degrees in the math department and also the physics department. Um, uh, but I, I, did, uh, I did get to teach and um, was funded through the philosophy department, which uh, meant I got to talk about things like the trolley problem before anybody oh. even thought about the, 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 the company Uber and certainly about self-driving Ubers. Yeah, that's so cool. So you were thinking about ethics and writing about it, studying about it, and philosophy, and asking really good questions. And well, I guess that whole, like, just the question asking is a huge part of data science, and that's what you're trained in. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I would say um, cer certainly uh, clarity of thought is, the, is one, of the, uh, one of the things that, that you, you teach and that you learn um, in philosophy departments, uh, you know how, how what how applicable all the other stuff is uh, really yeah. depends on whom you're studying with um, mm -hmm. and, and and what what their ideas are. Um, I, I would say also equally um, thinking really carefully about what uh, what a sound scientific investigation is, and that was uh, probably the core of a lot of my work um, as as a as a graduate student. Um, how we mathematically represent different uh, phenomena, um, what, what counts as uh, veridical representation and what does not. Um, and, and ultimately, I, I actually learned how to code late in life, uh, relatively speaking. But uh, um, it's because of that that I, that I did uh, end up getting my hands on, dirty with machine learning. Mm. So what, what was, so you were, um, you went to, you got your PhD. Um, so you had so many different options. Um, going in industry, staying in academia, what was kind of like when you're finishing your PhD program, what were you thinking about doing? Um, yeah, so, so I, um, I, 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 was, I was wrapping up some stuff as I, as I was, uh, you know, some academic work and uh, I got this offer to come out to, uh, to California, to, to the Bay Area and, and, and create a, a lab. Um, uh, sort of an industry lab for um, Sears Holdings Company, and, and I, I uh, ended up t packing up my family and moving out here. Um, it's been uh, it's been a great decision. I couldn't be happier with, uh, with with not just the opportunities that that I've had to to um, to really contribute to um, 
to what industry machine learning um, looks like, but also uh, to, to participate in, in, in training programs and, and the sorts of things that um, that have opened up doors for um, f- for a whole world of talent that, that probably never would have gotten a chance to to work on uh, on data in the way that we do this decade. Mm. So, uh, what were some of the the first kind of projects you worked on that you were really excited about after finishing your PhD and coming to California? What were some of the things you were kind of focused on and enjoyed working on? Um, well, one of the one of the first things that that I uh, and, and full disclosure, it still is not there. Uh, one of the first things that got me really um, interested in, in uh, was uh, doing uh, indoor navigation. Uh, and, and we actually did some, oh. some pilot projects with that. Um, it's you know we've we've had uh, GPS for like almost two decades. It's been a it's been a common um, a, a common uh, uh, product that people use in order to navigate. Uh, and and for some reason, when you walk into a store, uh, you, you still cannot uh, get, get you, you cannot open up your phone and say, hey, um, you know, show me where the show show me where the toothpaste is. And and so um, there is a whole host of engineering reasons for that, and why um, you know obviously G- GPS does not um, penetrate um, pe- penetrate buildings, so that's why we don't use GPS indoors. Uh, and solutions that um, that will supplement um, the 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 issues where, where that that will supplement for for the fact that you don't have GPS are yeah. actually. Um, you know, there's just a lot of scattering problems, and so indoor navigation is very difficult. Now, what got me excited was replicating that online experience. So mm-hmm. you, know, you walk into you, you walk into a digital an e-commerce site, and you can immediately search for whatever you want. Um, you get it within microseconds, and um, and, uh, and 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 or milliseconds at least. Uh, and you um, you also probably see other things that you uh, want to buy with that product. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so figuring out a way of integrating um, routing through a store so that, uh, especially if it's a grid-like store, so you can take several different paths to get from one place to another place, um, you can dynamically route that path without taking any more steps uh, physically, but route it so that way, um, if you're looking for the toothpaste, maybe we walk you by the toothbrushes instead of the, um, the hair nets. Mm. Yeah, I, so do, do you, uh, like, how are people that are working on this project now, like indoor navigation, what are some of the things that they're working on? Do you think that there'll ever be a time where internal, I'm sorry, indoor navigation will like work? Like, <laughs> I, uh, I hope springs eternal. Um, I'm certain <laughs> that one day, <laughs> one day it will be, I, I, I mean, this has been, it's been a uh, better part of a decade since I worked on this project. Um, yeah. Of course, you still can't do indoor navigation, which leads me to believe that, uh, things haven't gotten much better. Um, the 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 what you can do with recommendations, though, and what you can do with um, mm. you know people that are using uh, handheld devices as they shop, um, you know, that's just become even more a part of our lives, and, and as it was in the beginning of this decade. So, um, yeah, that, that's fascinating, and um, yeah, it's it'll be really cool to see how that evolves over time and indoor navigation getting better and better. Yeah. Um, you know, today today's episode is all about uh, fake news and mm-hmm. how it spreads and what we can do to help stop it. How do we detect it? What what first made you interested in kind of working to help solve this problem? Yeah. So so the term fake news, I'm sure existed um, has existed for for years. Um, I, I yeah. it became very popular. Um, Maybe just in the last two years or so, uh, and, um, and 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 uh, yeah, around that time, around you know, year two years ago, year and a half, um, I remember thinking that uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of focus on uh, on solving this problem, uh, but but nobody was really trying to solve it, um, maybe in a way that that was scalable. And, and um, mm-hmm. let me explain a little bit more about what what, what I mean by that. Um, so fact checking uh, uh, sites. Are are uh, as as any good journalism. I mean, you know, these are these are um, these are gifts to society, 
right? These are things yes. that, that have a lot of virtue that are about, you know, sharing knowledge with the world. And, and fact checking is about not just sharing that knowledge, but giving us confidence in the, um, in the things that are, are being shared so that we know that, that so that we know that we know it. Um, and, and uh, that's great. The, 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 the challenge with that is uh, it's not scalable. When, when you have so much text that's created on a daily basis in the internet that can be shared so freely without any friction whatsoever, there's only so much that you can do when you're trying to solve the truth problem. When you're trying to solve mm -hmm. the problem of, is what I'm reading uh, true and does it correspond to um, to to the world, to what the world's yes. really like, and and, and um, especially you know, there's there's a lot of um, hope that that maybe AI can do this, right? Uh, machine learning can do this, and you have know, great new algorithms um, and new new technologies, algorithmic technologies out there that can um, can handle text. So why not just use that? And and the and part of the reason is that it's hard to train on new facts. Um, without a ground truth, without, um, without, without an ability of getting a lot of data about whatever that those surrounding facts are. Um, nope. Oh, did I come off? I think I lost. Oh, sorry, Mike. I think I lost the phone connection. I'll call you right back. <laughs> Here we go again. Uh, for those watching live, I apologize. I am just uh, calling Mike back. Here we go. Hey, Mike, yeah. <laughs> sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> Technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So, so, so news has to be new, and that means it's very difficult to solve algorithmically. It's hard to it's hard to solve the truth problem algorithmically. So, on the one hand, you have you have sort of uh, uh, fact checking and going out and doing all of that investigative um, uh, hard work that needs to be done in order to figure out whether or not what's been written is true. On the other hand, very low skill. Um, and so, so w when uh, I was thinking about this and thinking about, uh, you know, what can we do with modern natural language algorithms? Um, it, it's really a, almost an, a, an orthogonal direction, a different, a, taking in a different approach and thinking about not um, how do you algorithmically detect what's true and what's false, but how do you algorithmically detect when the words on the page yeah. are sharing information and are about sharing information, whether or not that information is verified or is true is, is, is a separate hard conversation, but whether or not the intent and the way that those words on the page are, are, are being presented is about, um, you know, letting the, uh, the user, letting the reader um, ha take the words on the page and then, um, and then come up with a, with a, with the judgment for themselves or, on the other hand, uh, trying to influence them or manipulate their reactions is um, that's a that's a solvable problem. And um, let me let me say a little bit more about about what I mean by that. Uh, so for uh, for, for a um, uh, for a human, uh, there there are these natural reactions that we have when we're exposed to certain language, certain turns of phrase, we get um, our, our ability to think about what we are reading actually decreases when we end up getting triggered with certain things like fear or, or, like, mm. or, or, um, or anger or um, those emotional engagement. Emotional engagement actually makes us stop overthinking about we, what we're doing and react because that's um, probably in lots of times a better, uh, a, a safer way to proceed than to uh, really investigate when we're in the presence of danger. And so, um, so the hypothesis, really the hypothesis underlying the entire project was that maybe instead of trying to algorithmically detect truth and falsity, we algorithmic, truth versus uh, falsity, we algorithmically try to detect the intention, the, the intention mm. to inform versus the intention to manipulate, the intention to influence the reader in a way, whether for influence for good or influence for, for evil, so to speak, um, influence the reader. And that's the sort of thing that there, there, was, that, there was good, um, you know, underlying uh, scientific research that to suggest that uh, that there, there actually are patterns like that, like um, triggering mm. emotional concepts. And so that's the sort of thing that our algorithms are designed to to search. And, and it seems like we do get pretty strong, pretty uh, pretty powerful patterns um, when, when we look at it that way. That's fascinating. So it's interesting you just, you, um, as you started to explain this, how when we read something, uh, based on the intention, sometimes something could make us very upset. It can change our emotions. 
And by changing our emotions, you were saying that in some cases we become less likely to check the facts. Is that right? Or we're, or we're like, it's even worse than that. We, we become um, our, our, our human, uh, our, our, our mortal human bodies <laughs> yeah. um, end up, end up uh, actually um, ha having a, 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 a physiological reaction when there are senses of urgency, when there is fear, when there is a sense of danger, when, and we mm. stop critically evaluating to our full capabilities what we are reading, what we are hearing, and we start responding and we respond mm. in ways that, um, uh, you know, for the most part, I, we evolve this way. So, so, yeah. so it must be that for the most part in the wild, what we're, we're more effective than not, but, um, but actually uh, for when it comes to evaluating the news, uh, you know, we need that extra uh, technology. Um, and, and so creating something like a, uh, and this isn't to say that emotional, um, emotional reading, uh, listening to pundits, uh, I love eating ice cream. Uh, and, and, and I take, took my son to get ice cream this weekend. Uh, and, yeah. and uh, um, you know, as long as we have the nutrition facts, and I know that eating ice cream is something that is not something that is supposed to be healthy, but it, it's, <laughs> it's maybe, um, it's it maybe got a high dosage of certain sugar, adding that extra information for people to know that while they indulge, this is what they're actually indulging in, um, mm. will also hopefully empower them to do, um, to, 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 understand more about how they process all the information that they have available to them. Yeah, it, it, that's, uh, that's fascinating. And I love how you kind of brought it back down to like, as humans, our fight and fight response. Um, Sorry, one second. Oh, no problem. I'm gonna have to switch one more time to another audio solution. No worries. <laughs> Let's try these. <laughs> How's that? Is that okay. Better? All right. Okay, perfect. That kind of charm. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about how you were saying how, and I, I never thought about how emotions can cause us to, when it comes to like news or reading something online, how that can trigger us to um, maybe leap to conclusions um, and how it's based on like evolutionary biology of this flight or fight response of, mm -hmm. We, we have to either make a decision, we have to make a decision very quickly uh, whether we need to, right? If it's fear-based, like we need to, you know, take action quickly because um, we could be harmed uh, potentially. So is that kind of like where it kind of, that kind of evolutionary uh, yeah. response? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's exactly it. And uh, on the website, uh, so IBM uh, did, a, did a little cartoon about this as part of a series of, of, uh, of machine learning cartoons that they're doing. So we, uh, we, we did a, a little bit of a joke uh, um, uh, comic in that, in that cartoon about this, where uh, they have two cave, cavemen um, coming up, to a, coming up to, a, to a cave and, and they see a, a shadow in the back and it's a little bit bear-like. Uh, and so the first one's thinking it through really carefully and wants to use their scientific um, uh, um, uh, scruples in order to rationally scrutinate, uh, scrutinize uh, um, what's in the back of the cave. And yeah. the, other, the other guy kind of runs away. And, and then the, the, the question is, which one do you think survived? Um, to <laughs> <their ancestor? laughs> That's great. So, so um, yeah, like you were saying, like there is so much content online um, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, social media sites, news sites, blogs, so much content is being produced. We're being inundated with content. Um, and just going through our, my Twitter feed, I mean, every single tweet is a piece of content that I could either believe, not believe, or it's sarcasm, satire. There's all these different types of content that's out there. So how does, um, how does deep learning, the work that you're doing, how does it help to began to categorize this content and help determine like a percentage of truth, falsity, sarcasm, like what's, what's kind of like the process that it begins to like figure out, and determine how truthful something is. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, you know, that was the, the idea in a few a couple years ago, maybe uh, 18 months ago or so. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I got together um, some, some of the, 
the the best and the brightest who have been in my lab, some colleagues whom I really uh, I really trust and mm -hmm. and whom I've worked with uh, before, and with whom I've worked uh, before, and uh, and then I, uh, I I said, hey, why don't we try to solve this problem? And the first thing we did was build these simplest model we could. Um, we, we, we just used um, good old fashioned uh, word to vec and there are open uh, open uh, 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 libraries now uh, for doing that and for embedding um, embedding uh, paragraphs and documents uh, as single vectors, and all the all of these uh, use uh, you know, for for those in the audience, um, you know these these neural embedding algorithms um, have have a very simple trick, which is um, solve a often very shallow neural network to uh, or, or have have a very shallow neural network solve uh, one problem like uh, guess the next word problem, and then uh, figure out how to embed how to represent. Um, the, the, these words as vectors um, in, uh, with that neural network uh, task uh, in order to solve that problem. And it turns out when you do that, actually the numerical representation, the vector representation of these words um, does a couple of really great things. Number one, it, it, um, it manages the uh, dimensionality and, and the, um, the, the, the sparsity of your representations a lot, a lot more effectively than um, we did in the olden days uh, back, back in the yeah. Pre 2013, um, and, and, and number <laughs> number two, uh, it, it actually starts to capture semantics. So some of the famous uh, examples that the early papers um, did these analogy completion, and you can do arithmetic with these numerical representations. So you can take uh, the, one of the most famous ones is you can take the king vector, um, and then you can subtract the the masculinity vector and add the femininity vector, and and lo and behold, you end up where. Um, the queen vector is, and so the um, the meaning of these words started to get captured in the numerical representation. And so we took these very simple algorithms to start, uh, and and just wanted to see if there's signal there, right? Wanted to validate the hypothesis that maybe something is going on um, with this this idea that you can just pick up on patterns of manipulation, of sensationalism, of driving an agenda, of of even just stating an opinion versus the sort of presentation of information for the consumer to make their own decision, the reader to make their own decision, journalism. Um, and, and, and it turned out that we were getting, uh, we, we were not getting bulletproof signal, we were getting some signal. And so that's mm -hmm. when we really got to work and we started opening up the box on all of the really amazing research that has been done over the last say four years using recurrent neural nets that look at words in order and then try to, um, to and, you know, an LSTM, long short term memory networks that look at them, not just in order, but remember the important things and forget other things about the sentence as they look at each word. Now these words already have been represented as, um, in, as uh, numerically through that, through that first mm -hmm. product pro process. And there's actually several different methods of representing words numerically that are now used um, in tandem. And uh, and now you can represent the, by the time you get to that end of, the end of that sentence, you can represent um, almost the meaning the meaning of the entire word. And there's a lot of other things. Usually, you'll read it uh, front to back, and then you'll also have the an algorithm read it back to front. And so now you have mm. a rep numerical representation of the entire sentence um, both ways. And uh, there are other mechanisms that you use in order to pay attention to which words are the most important words. And then there are things called hierarchical um, um, models that, that look at it um, not just at the word level, but at the sentence level. And so we took advantage of all of these different techniques, these techniques that have also been used not just for uh, classification of text, like this is journalism, this is not journalism, but have been used to improve um, uh, abstractive summarization. So summarizing a large body of text by mm -hmm. compressing it into a vector that represents the content of the entire um, the entire text that the algorithm read, so to speak, and then and then unraveling that vector in order to rewrite the sentence and, and, or rewrite the text, the content of that paragraph in a shorter um, shorter form sentence or neural machine translation. This is what's done in uh, German uh, uh, English to German translations. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, the modern usage of machine translation in uh, in things like uh, like Google Translate are really driven by this kind of technique. And so we thought, why don't we use these techniques 
vector represent the entire body of text uh, or, or, or content in, in a particular text, a particular document, um, and in particular, paying attention to things that tend to jump out, the things that, the words that really jump out, the sentences that really jump out in the paragraph, the paragraphs that really jump out in the, um, in the entire document. And then what we're gonna do is build a classifier. And so some of these um, vector representations end up getting mapped to areas that are, um, are crisply uh, identifiable as the journalism area. Um, and others mm -hmm. are mapped to other areas of our, of our, um, our, our space, our numerical space, that are uh, crisply identifiable as not journalism, or wiki, or sensational, or opinion, or mm -hmm. um, agenda-driven. And uh, we, we've been getting pretty decent, uh, pretty decent results in, in being able to um, to carve out which of these areas uh, correspond to what kind of writing and how to represent that uh, uh, relatively quickly. Um, and, and then the the app is is really uh, mostly for fun, uh, but hopefully something that uh, that as we uh, as we get it to the point where um, where we want to get it, we get other people to contribute. Um, then we'll uh, it'll be something that maybe people can use for the better. That is that is absolutely amazing. So you're you're converting every like every word into a number, and mm -hmm. and then through that process. So does it? I guess does it matter what sort of content's coming in at that point? If it's just all turning into numbers. Um, well, well, it's it's uh, it's it's sequences of numbers, right? Because um, you know, on one on on the on on a one number line, um, there, there's only so much information, right? We know that five is bigger than two, um, and but but then if we have like pairs of numbers or 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 quadruples of numbers, or it turns out usually it's about a hundred numbers um, in a vector representation. Uh, by representing, if you think about these as arrows pointing to different different points. Um, in a in a in a what we call a vector space, um, and, and you look at which area which area they're pointing to, um, it turns out that there's a lot of semantics that is captured um, when you give it that many degrees of freedom to to point, right? Yeah. So um, so right now the uh, cause I actually just um, added the the Chrome plugin for Faker mm -hmm. Fact. Uh, what what sort of sites? Is it good at or analyzing? Well, um, I, uh, one thing, and, and I've done a little bit of uh, looking into sociologically. Um, you know, lots of people trust the Wall Street Journal. It seems to be um, uh, yeah. uh, uniformly uh, respected as 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 bona fide journalism, both both by with, with what end of the political spectrum, for instance, that you're on. And so, um, so that's a good, that's a good source. Uh, you know, often the AP, there are, there are open Reuters data sets. Um, you know, there are also ones that are maybe a little bit less respected, but are, are um, you know, historical uh, uh, news publications. And, and, and so, and so, uh, looking at those as well um, would, would be, um, you know, as another option. And, and one thing that's important is that um, it does not look at the URL. The algorithm, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the common wisdom is the best way to understand if your news is fake is to look at the source, look at how long mm -hmm. it's been around, mm -hmm. what's the, yeah. you know, what, what's the, what's the tenure, what's the, um, you, you know, what's the reputation of the source. Uh, yeah, but but we sense. wanted to, uh, and by the way, we, we, we named the algorithm Walt uh, after Walter Cronkite. <laughs> we, we wanted, we wanted to, we, we almost tied Walt's um, metaphorical arms behind uh, its back because um, we, we did not let it look at the source at all. It looks only at mm. the title and the text on the page. And, and that, that cuts both ways. Number one, um, you know, news sites that want to maybe improve and, and, and want to um, want to have uh, you know, th their their goal is to be sh to is to share information and not to do punditry, not to scare, not to um, not to manipulate uh, or sensationalize. Uh, they they can always write a new fresh article, and if that article is written uh, in a way that shares information and is intending to share information, um, ideally, if, if the algorithm's working well, it'll detect that and doesn't it doesn't care what site it's published on, what the source is per se, um, and it cuts the other ways. Too, uh, you know, not all, um, not not all uh, news publications, whether they have a mm -hmm. historically left wing uh, or, or left leaning or right wing or no leaning mm -hmm. at all, um, will get uh, will be above reproach, and, and, and Walt will uh, ding certain <laughs> certain sites. Some, some journalists <laughs> uh, uh, have have 
have, have sent me messages because we won't <laughs> think too much of their, <laughs> their writing style. And and um, I almost think that that's a good thing because, uh, well, if, if you know, obviously we have to go back and see the algorithm's not bulletproof either, but yeah. Um, yeah. If, if Walt doesn't, um, that doesn't give a blank check to anybody. That, that's that's what mm. that's what we want, right? That is so funny. So <laughs> that's so funny that um that journalists are using this and like Mike, this is I'm writing the truth and this this algorithm is telling me it's fake. So how do you deal with that? Like somebody's mm. like they're journalists, like that's their job is to report the truth and they're writing for Wall Street Journal and then the algorithm is saying that this is like sixty percent accurate. Yeah, and and again, it's not about accuracy or truth and falsity. Okay, it's that. about it's about uh, how sensationally uh, sensational. Oh, okay, um, okay. Is it is it uh, journalism really stands for um, you know, information sharing? And then we actually have mm. two. We have we have more wiki, which doesn't necessarily have to be news journalism. Um, and, and we have, uh, but but more about learning. Uh, you know, like you would get from reading a Wikipedia article or something that's really more um, encyclopedic and informative. Um, and then also journalism label. Um, and and so, uh, you, the 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 performance metrics that we use. Um, so so just to be a little bit technical, um, you know, data scientists like to um, they look at accuracy. They also look at, at two metrics in particular that are often. Um, one metric is really associated with, um, with with false positives, and the other with false negatives. And, um, and so um, we look at, at things like precision. And precision means if I say um, if I say yes. This is journalism, or yes, this is sensational. Um, what are the chances mm. that, that that I'm right? Right. What are the chances that my as an algorithm mm. that I'm right? That what are the chances that the algorithm is right? Um, the other one is called recall, which is um, say of all the journalism articles that we show you, what percentage of them did you capture? What percentage of them did you correctly identify? Yes, that's journalism. That's journalism. That's journalism. Mm. And which ones did you leave on the table? So there's sort of this like false positive, false negative associated with each of these metrics. And the, the metrics are very, very good. Um, and for, for industry standards, um, it, you know, they, they are, uh, they are you know, if only we got such good results in all of the, the models that we've done, you know, high 90s and very accurate, um, but still not bulletproof, not perfect. Um, um, it turns out that, uh, that, that the, the level of, uh, of, Ability for humans to detect is is far worse than in the nineties. Uh, I recently read a read a paper about that. Um, but but you know, I think I'll be the first to say that I I wouldn't bet my thumbs on every single um, every single prediction of of, of mm. Waltz or really of, of, of any algorithm and mm. figuring out ways of um, of a, a opening up the space for feedback. Um, so that you can improve your training set, um, mm. figuring out ways of, of, uh, of putting in safeguards and also making sure that this is not something that is a, um, a tool for setting the standard for, um, you know, Walt says what's right and what's wrong, yeah. but just yeah. more information uh, about, right, about right. what signal comes in. Uh, that's, that's the goal. And, and we are looking right. at, um, we're looking at a new, a new, uh, 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 Features that we can add, where um, you know, I said that we, we we pay attention to like important words that get a good strong signal and the sentences that get a strong signal. So maybe figuring out ways of um, something that we want to do uh, do next of surfacing that to people. So when they say, well, why did it get a high journalism score? Mm. It'll show the sentences that that um, that Walt paid attention to most, um, mm. and the words in those sentences that Walt paid attention to most is one thing that we're thinking about next. I love that. So, I mean, what I love about this is that Walt is helping us be more critical when we look at content. It's helping us make a decision um, and flagging some things that we might not even be aware about as we're reading content because we get inundated with content. And so um, it's just another tool that we can use to determine um, how sensational or true something is. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, before we go, Mike, I know that you are, I mean, I, you have so many followers on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Um, you must get just inundated with messages and requests. And, um, you know, in our data science community, we have so many people who are are curious about um, how do I get started in data science? And I know you, know you must get this question a lot. What advice do you have for the new for new data scientists or people that are just finishing up school and looking to pursue a career? Um do you have do you have any like uh, 
advice for them that are, are looking to get started, uh, types of uh, careers to go for? Yeah, and and one of the things that um, that that uh, that I would say first is you know, you know we started this conversation. I said I got really lucky by getting to be a data scientist. I think that yeah. if uh, if I started as a philosopher, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, technical philosopher, I'm a philosopher nonetheless, um, in twenty uh, in twenty eighteen, I might have had a more difficult time getting into the field. I sort of got it un- got in under the wire, maybe. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, so so so. Um, it's sort of double-edged though, right? Um, now there are so many resources out there, some of which that I, uh, some of which I, I've participated in creating. Um, you know, so so the, the, the Berkeley uh, Meets program, um, you know, th- there, are, there are different uh, immersive programs out there. There are online programs out there. And so figuring out how to become a data scientist first become, starts with uh, getting the right, the right skills and making sure that you mm-hmm. have the right skills. Um, and whether you started as a as a physicist and uh, and and you uh, and, and you're, you're more like me, you, you, you knew you had a, like a lot of math- mathematical literacy, but maybe didn't code so much uh, to begin with. Uh, then there are resources out there for you, and, and, I, and I recommend you, you go that direction. If you uh, maybe are a developer, but you don't necessarily have all the mathematical literacy that it might be, or statistical, um, you know, probability theory literacy that uh, that is expected of a data scientist, then uh, you know there are resources out there for you. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, master's programs out there now. And when we first created the New Haven program, uh, there, there was nothing. There, there was, uh, you know, New Haven and Berkeley were, were some of the first ever. Uh, now, every university almost in the world has a master's program, and so getting that training is um, is a great, uh, great opportunity for anybody who wants to break into the field. Um, but that's not going to be enough. Getting those skills and making sure that you have those skills, at least um, yeah. that you've trained for those skills, is is only step one. Um, practice on projects. Come up with your own projects like research projects, uh, maybe there's a practical problem like fake news or whatever it is that gets you excited now that you have that training and you know what's possible. Uh, and build your own uh, build your own tool and build your own algorithms, uh, make your own applications, uh, uh, train your own, um, your own machine learning algorithms in order to solve these problems or accomplish these tasks, whatever they are, and put them uh, you know, put them up at GitHub. That will give you something very exciting and interesting to talk about when you apply for internships and eventually when you apply for um, for full time jobs. Uh, one of the things that I look for most is you know, what have you built. In fact, that's the uh, you know, just, uh, spoiler alert. Anybody who applies and that, that I interview, <laughs> I I ask them about a project and I ask them you know, several things about that project, but it, but it all centers around a project that you've actually built. And so. Um, so, so having that uh, that in your pocket is going to be really helpful for interviewing. More importantly, the more of these projects that you build, the more um, the more experience and the more understanding of all of the things that maybe you can't learn from reading uh, uh, Hasty and Tip Shirani's statistical learning book uh, um, become become evident. There, there's uh, data cleaning and and uh, I/O and and. Uh, managing um, implementation and speed, and and um, and using cloud services, all of these things that uh, uh, everything that could go wrong when you actually tr- are training in the business of training your algorithm, uh, not to not to mention all the other engineering pieces. Um, and the more experience you have with solving those problems and banging your head against your uh, against your your monitor and debugging and even just um, you know searching on Stack Overflow for how to fix problems, that, so that's how you're going to get started. Um, that's really valuable experience, and, and before you know it, you, you've um, you've mastered things that that seemed almost impossible when 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 you mm-hmm. first uh, tried to get things working. That's great. That's great advice, uh, Mike. Uh, w- one last question um, for people that are trying to contact you: do's and don'ts, any pet peeves? Because I know you must be getting tons of messages <laughs> on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Um, uh, yeah. Any um, advice? <laughs> I, uh, you know, I do, I do try to open up the LinkedIn messages uh, every once in a while. I, I please do not take personally if I, if I missed your message, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, because because it's just hard for, um, I, I would say, I've ground in, 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 um, in messages, unfortunately. Um, the, uh, y- yeah, gosh, I don't know, best way to contact me, uh, there, there's, I my emails uh, uh, yeah. public on, on, on Berkeley. I think that that might be 
that might be the best way. Uh, and, and certainly if you're interested in um, doing research, if you have um, work that you've done in the past, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to hear about it. I'd love for you to, um, to, to show me what you've done. And, and uh, you know, we do take uh, applications for the, um, for, for, for my, uh, my lab in the spring and the fall. Uh, it's, it's a little bit late in the fall um, round, but uh, we are always looking for um, you know, great postdocs and, 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 and PhDs and, and, and uh, people that are completing the master's program um, to, to, uh, who want to work on interesting projects like, like this one. That's awesome. Uh, so for everyone listening to the podcast, um, you could just do a Google search for Mike Tamir, T-A-M-I-R. You can find him on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Make sure you're following him there. And um, when Mike's posting uh, tweets or um, content on LinkedIn, you know, like it, comment, engage. Um, but don't be offended if Mike can't get back to you right away because he's very, very busy. But, um, but that's those are some places where you can follow him. If you are looking to get more uh, links, uh, some resources from today's show, and also the full transcription, uh, you can go to the uh, Data Talk website. And the short URL for today's episode with Mike Tamir is ex.pn slash Data Talk 63. Again, that's ex.pn slash Data Talk 63. And that'll bring you over to the video, uh, the full podcast, as well as a transcription and links to Mike's social profile so you can follow him there. Uh, Dr. Tamir, thank you so much for being our special guest. It was an honor to have you and hope we can chat again soon. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. It was a, it was a lot of fun.